thanks, John. And good afternoon, everybody. It's really wonderful to see so uh, many familiar faces. Um, and I look forward to reuniting with many of you in person, hopefully someday very soon. Um, I am required to um, submit disclosures whenever I do any kind of national presentation. So even though I do have conflicts, many of them are interpersonal conflicts, I have no financial conflicts. Um, I uh, will talk about um, some things that are um, from the general research literature, and you're welcome to access those on your own. I'm not trying to sell you nothing. Um, I am a trustee of the Lovett School here in Atlanta. Next slide, please. Um, so I wanted to begin with a reminder for many of us of the origins of mental illnesses. Next slide, please. So if you made the mistake of taking Greek, which is um, typically not a good choice ever, this is your one opportunity to use that useless information. Because understanding the development of psychiatric conditions um, is really described using what we call the stress diathesis model. And in Greek, the term diathesis translates literally to mean of God. We use it in a scientific way to mean a genetic confirmation. So um, there's a combination of what happens in the environment that we're calling the stress part of this model and what you bring to the environment as your genes, which we're calling the diathesis. So a diathesis is a genetic predisposition. And in order of likelihood, we know that many mental illnesses have a genetic component to them. The number one illness is bipolar affective disorder, type one in particular, which has a heritability of 0.85. And what that means is that roughly 80% of everybody who goes on to phenotypically develop the signs and symptoms of bipolar illness have at the time of their birth, the known genetic mutations that are associated with bipolar illness. Schizophrenia, major depressive disorder, obsessive compulsive disorder, substance use disorders, um, some personality disorders are genetic, and a behavior that we oftentimes misconceptualize as a choice or a volitional behavior is actually conferred in somebody's genes, and that's suicide completions. So in the general population, over the last several years, we've seen a uh, steady uptick in, uh, uptick in the number of people who die from suicide. And within families that have a family history of suicide completions, this actually is outpacing the increase um, for overall suicides from an epidemiologic point of view. Now, if you do the math, you can see that none of these illnesses is 100% heritable. Unlike things like Huntington's chorea or Tay-Sachs disease, there's not any mental illness wherein if you have the genetic mutations, you literally will have a 100% chance of developing the illness. So what is the other component? It's the stress component. And again, in order of likelihood, we know that stressors make it more likely that the genes will kick in and turn on if you have them, if you experience these, particularly as a young child. Um, adverse childhood events like abuse or neglect, neglect increase the, the rates and the likelihood of developing every known mental illnesses, um, including suicide completions. Early subs substance misuse is a risk factor in this model. Major losses like the death of a parent or a partner, um, moving frequently, transitions that are unanticipated can also be the stress that tips the genetic um, uh, components of the stress diathesis model into turning on. Bullying turns out to be crucially important and pandemics, um, once you know it, we're seeing a, a real increase in the number of adolescents and young adults who are newly being diagnosed with mood and anxiety disorders. Um, I'm going to um, project, and unfortunately, I think that the projections are um, widely anticipated to be true, that the second wave of the COVID-19 pandemic is going to be the mental health sequela. And we're um, all going to be um, ne needed more than ever as um, these things turn out to be uh, uh, more related to uh, mood and anxiety problems. Next slide, please. So this is a schematic um, that makes it just one step more complicated. We've talked about the stress diathesis model and the genes, but it turns out that there's another environmental component called epigenes that make this model a little bit more difficult. And it's important to understand the science 
because as we shift gears and Dr. Falk tells, talks more about um, things that can uh, be done to help prevent the development or the severity of mental illnesses, epigenetics turn out to be really important. So epigenes are genetic information that is actually upstream from known genes in chromosomes. And we used to think that that gen genetic information was static and that it really didn't code for anything useful. What we now know is that epigenes change minute by minute through the simple methylation, the addition of a carbon atom and three hydrogen atoms to one of the DNA alphabet uh, letters. And a methylation can actually flip an epigene from being in what we call an inhibitor position into being what we call a promoter of the downstream gene. So this is more simplistic than it should be, but if you have the genetic diathesis for developing depression and through what happens in your environment, let's say your partner dies, the methylation of the epigene upstream from that gene flips into a promoter position that would be the time when you would have your first episode of major depressive disorder. So genes code for proteins through RNA. Proteins change anatomy in the brain. That means that it could change the number of receptors, let's say for the serotonin molecule. And those uh, neurotransmitters modulate uh, feelings, thinking, and behavior, which ironically go back and feed into the stability or lack thereof of epigenes that makes this whole process go in a circular way. Next slide, please. So traditionally in psychopharmacology, we have a love affair with the synapse, the space between two neuronal axons. And we think that we can change the way people think, feel, and behave through modulating the uh, number of neurotransmitters within the synaptic cleft. But look, next slide please, at all of the other potential points of interruption. We could maybe stabilize epigenes. So if you know that a child has the genetic diathesis for depression, if we could stabilize the upstream epigenes such that when they have an adverse childhood event, they will remain in an inhibitor position, it sort of doesn't matter that they have the gene for depression. Um, maybe we can actually change genes someday so that if um, there's a, a family uh, a genetic predisposition for serious mental illnesses, we might be able to even change the genetic diathesis um, that would result in those people developing signs and symptoms. Certainly modulating the way people think, feel, or behave is a tenet of CBT as well as lots of other psychotherapeutic modalities. And I'm gonna present now a new idea to many of you, which is that one of the things that might be really important in preventing the development of mental illnesses at all, or certainly in improving the prognosis of somebody with mental illnesses, is that we could actually help by decreasing inflammation. So the part of my um, presentation this afternoon is really putting the brain back in the body. We know that mental illnesses affect the way that your brain works and they produce behavioral problems in a lot of people, but you have to look below the neck in order to truly understand how to prevent and mitigate the development of mental illnesses. Next slide, please. So I'm gonna to try to convince you that mental illnesses are medical problems. And the data here really began um, increasing in importance um, around the change of the millennium. When then um, Surgeon General Dr. Satcher released his landmark report on the state of the American mental health system, calling it besides other things in a shambles. And Dr. Satcher um, did some multi-center uh, studies where he looked at populations of people with mental illnesses, in this case, major depressive disorder, and he compared physical variables of that group to the same variables of the general population. And here's what Dr. Satcher found, which at the time really was poo-pooed by the psychiatric community. We thought maybe um, the studies were done incorrectly or there weren't enough people enrolled or something else. Um, because Dr. Satcher showed and started to publish that people with depression on average have higher core body temperatures than people in the general population. It's almost as if somebody with depression has a chronic low-grade fever. Now we're not at the point where we're going to take temperatures to diagnose major depressive disorder because these are population averages, but isn't that an interesting um, and somewhat unexpected finding? 
Dr. Satcher also showed that people with um, depression have decreased heart rate variability compared to the general population. It takes somebody who's equally physically fit, who's depressed, longer to get their heart beating to the rate we want when they exercise than it does somebody who is on the next treadmill over who does not have major depressive disorder. And the converse is true as well. Once somebody stops exercising, it takes a depressed person longer to get their heart rate back to resting levels than it does somebody who does not have depression. Third, we know that people with depression, particularly treatment-resistant depression, who don't respond to the usual interventions, have abnormal concentration of inflammatory mediators. And I'm going to show you a graph of that in just a second. And through a cascade of very complicated inflammation response uh, um, within somebody's immune system, fat cells in people who have major depressive disorder actually pick up and they redistribute themselves away from your limbs, your arms and your legs to your gut. And so there's some really important physiologic changes that occur that have nothing to do with your brain when people develop the signs and symptoms of depression. And we can look at it from the opposite perspective as well, which is that people with certain physical medical illnesses have much higher rates of depression. We used to think it was because, yeah, you know you've got insight into the fact that you're, you're, you have cancer, so you should be depressed. But it's much more complicated than that knowledge. Um, as one example, people with pancreatic carcinoma, um, Alex Trebek included, almost 95% of those people have as their first indication of cancer, the new development of major depression. Way before they ever have any knowledge that they have a carcinoma, they experience the symptoms of major depressive disorder. Next slide, please. And so we started to wonder, well, what's going on outside of somebody's brain when they develop mental illnesses? What do the genes and the genetic diathesis for things like depression or schizophrenia do to the um, rest of your body? And it turns out that this is a picture of my friend slash foe, the macrophage. It's an electron microgram of a macrophage. Next slide, please. And the macrophage is illustrated here in the center of this slide um, that um, has been, uh, I've received permission to share it um, by the uh, study author, Andy Miller. And what Dr. Miller and his team showed is that when there's any kind of pathogen in your system, um, COVID-19 virus or a bacteria, or you step on a nail and there's um, uh, dirt in your foot, the macrophage recognizes those pathogens and starts to initiate a cascade of an immune response. And that's really helpful because it gets rid of whatever shouldn't be there. Locally, you develop tumor, ruber, calor, and dolor, which in Latin means it swells, it gets red, it hurts, and it gets hot. And those classic symptoms of inflammation are very beneficial from an evolutionary point of view because it helps clear the infection. But look at what happens when those exact same inflammatory mediators, tissue necrosis factor, interleukin-1, interleukin-6, and interferon alpha are just four of them. When they cross your blood-brain barrier and go into your brain, look at what happens. You get a fever, you feel tired, you stop eating, you don't enjoy doing things you used to like to do, which we call amhedonia, and your sleep-wake cycle changes. Do those sound familiar to anybody? Everyone should be shaking their head because it, they are really symptoms of depression. Um, and, and maybe until today, you didn't think that fever was part of depression. But again, the studies that um, were done in the early 2000s show that uh, on average, people with depression have a chronic low grade fever. Next slide, please. And so the theory that has resulted from this information is that maybe people with mental illnesses have uncontrolled global inflammation. We know that this is the case, especially in people who have treatment resistant depression, where a relative indicator of uncontrolled inf inflammation called a C-reactive protein level is a good predictor of whether or not somebody with depression is going to respond to treatment. Um, so we call this the pro-inflammatory cytokine theory. Um, and we measure um, in our new patients who admit to services a, a lab test called CRP. 
And when CRP is above three milligrams per liter, we know that that person in general has global uncontrolled inflammation. And it really can change some of the things that we do from a treatment perspective. And I'm gonna share with you some of the non-pharmacologic things that we wanna do in a minute um, for all patients with mental illnesses, but there are some pharmacologic things that we are interested in as well. Um, a trial is going to be published this year out of the UK where they're looking at a very potent inflammatory mediator inhibitor named uh, tocilizumab, which currently is being used to treat people with rheumatoid arthritis. And the idea is that that medication may actually produce better results than traditional psychiatric uh, medication treatment for people with depression. So stay tuned. Next slide, please. So um, I want to put the brain back into the body and talk about some very benign lifestyle modifications that we should all be doing. Next slide, please. And the American Psychiatric Association, then chaired by uh, Paul Sumagrad, who's the chair of psychiatry at Tufts uh, Medical School, um, developed a top 10 list of things that we want to focus on to help our patients with mental illnesses get better. And these are sort of the problems when people don't move, when they have obesity, when they smoke. And I want to spend just a few minutes, literally two minutes, um, doing a deeper dive on a couple of these um, so that we can see um, how important these lifestyle modifications can be. Next slide, please. Starting with exercise. Everybody needs to exercise, but especially people with mental illnesses. And the kind of exercise that has been shown to be the best in a study out of Shepard Pratt um, by my friend Steve Sharfstein is this kind called HIT, high intensity interval training. And what HIT is, is it is an opportunity um, for somebody to do very intensive cardiovascular exercise for a short burst and then let their heart rate come back to resting levels before they do the same thing over um, again for at least 20 minutes in a row. It's painful, um, but it really is good from a mental health perspective. And now you can see why, if you connect the dots, that people with mental illnesses, especially people with depression, have decreased heart rate variability. HIT helps your body retrain itself to be reactive from a heart rate variability perspective. And then at least two days a week, we want people to do strength training exercise that focuses on the largest muscle groups of all, your glutes and your quads. So instead of doing arm exercises, um, curls for the girls is what our patients say, don't do those, do lunges and do things that um, operate the bigger muscle groups because it's anti-inflammatory. Next slide, please. Weight control turns out to be really important because macrophages live in fat cells. So if you have more fat cells, you have more macrophages. And using the pro-inflammatory cytokine theory, um, getting rid of macrophages is a good thing. Next slide, please. This is a study that we did at Skyland Trail that actually shows when people gain weight when they're in treatment, um, they actually do worse from a clinical outcomes point of view. So we looked at a bunch of different kinds of patients and showed that weight maintenance or even better loss in patients who didn't have issues with food, no eating disorders, that that actually augmented the outcomes of that person's mental health treatment. Next slide, please. Um, mitigation of other inflammation turns out to be important. It's why we want all patients who have mental illnesses to continue to see an evidence-based primary care doctor get their teeth cleaned every six months, take care of their uh, dermatologic problems, because these are other sources of inflammation. Next slide, please. Um, and then sleep turns out to be really important. And there are good studies that show when people get restorative sleep, which means eight hours a night of uninterrupt, uh, uninterrupted sleep, um, that that can be anti-inflammatory. It also is the way that you learn something. So for um, any trainees who are out there, if you're uh, like me and you procrastinate to cram for an exam the night before, it's actually better to study for a little bit and then to allow yourself to get eight hours of sleep the night before your exam, because that's when your brain does what we call prune. It gets rid of the unnecessary connections between brain cells and strengthens the connections that are meaningful. 
So sleep turns out to be a very important lifestyle recommendation that we want to um, make sure we prioritize for all of our patients with mental illnesses. Next slide, please. Healthy eating is crucially important. Um, in general, what the recommendation from the task force from the APA is, is to focus on getting a Mediterranean diet with omega-3 fatty acids. Um, we also sometimes prescribe supplements of omega-3 fatty acids for people who are not responding to traditional interventions of psychiatric care. The recommended dose um, from uh, recent research is to do two grams of omega-3 fatty acids two times per day. Um, better to get it through food, but sometimes it's hard to get um, that much omega-3 fatty acids. Next slide, please. And so I'm going to stop with my part and um, ask Dr. Falk to continue our discussion. But remember, mental illnesses are medical problems, and you can't have good mental health without good physical health. Amanda? Thank you so much. That was amazing. Um, it's, it's so fascinating to hear and learn about um, the biology behind all of this. Um, and, you know, I, I think that what we, what we all know as mental health providers that the biological, the psychological, the social, the emotional, the spiritual even are all intertwined very uh, intricately. And you cannot help a person when you're only focusing on one at the expense of, of the others. So I'm going to really focus in on um, the psychological, the social, emotional benefits of um, holistic practices. And I'm really going to focus in on mindfulness and meditation, um, which are, are certainly backed by, by science. Next slide. Thank you. So there are, um, research has, has shown many, many, many benefits to mindfulness and meditation practices. Um, and, you know, it's, it's fascinating because even though research backs so much um, mindfulness and meditation practices, especially in the treatment of mental illnesses, um, insurance companies, when you are submitting bills for reimbursement for mental health treatment are always sort of wanting to uh, not necessarily reimburse for those services. So today I really wanna talk about um, why they should and all of the different benefits of mindfulness and meditation. The first being better focus and concentration. There was a study done in 2011 by Harvard Medical School that found a connection between mindfulness uh, and processing new information scans actually found an increase in gray matter in parts of the brain responsible for learning and memory. So focus attention, mindfulness and meditation practice is a learnable skill. And like any skill, the more you practice, the better that you are going to get at it. So having mindfulness and meditation baked in to your day-to-day -day clinical treatment programming is inevitably going to support better focus, attention, and concentration. Improved self-esteem and self-awareness. So self-inquiry meditation explicitly aims to help an individual develop a greater understanding of their self and then how to relate to those in the world around them. And what we know is that when people have a better understanding of self and a better relationship with others, they feel better. And symptoms of anxiety, depression, substance use tend to get mitigated. The, the, the more integrated that we can be with our social environment. Other forms of meditation and mindfulness and yoga can teach indiv individuals how to recognize their thoughts and thoughts that might be harmful or self-defeating and can help steer individuals to more constructive patterns. So these holistic practices can really encourage clients to slow down, to encourage meta-awareness, allowing for deeper self-reflection, which can then increase the ability to examine one's own thoughts and one's own feelings without judgment, which helps improve self-esteem. 
So again, it's not just process groups talking about self-esteem and identifying feelings and feeling charged. Sometimes just sitting and learning how to be mindful and learning how to meditate can help people feel better about themselves and heighten self-esteem and self-awareness. Reduce stress. What we know is high cortisol levels disrupt sleep, increase blood pressure and fatigue, which makes us more vulnerable to stress. Holistic practices like mindfulness, meditation, yoga can lower the levels of cortisol, which will help us feel more relaxed. In an eight week study, a meditation style called mindfulness meditation was found to reduce the inflammation response, which we just heard about, that is caused by stress. Uh, some studies have also shown that meditation practices may improve symptoms of stress-related conditions, including irritable bowel syndrome, post-traumatic stress disorder, and fibromyalgia. And we will be sending all these slides out so you can see the citations for um, the actual studies and you can feel free to, um, to read them. Next slide. Mindfulness and meditation help us to manage symptoms of anxiety and depression. In a 2014 research analysis published in JAMA, we, they found that mindfulness meditation can help ease anxiety and depression and can and should be a part of comprehensive mental health treatment planning. The 2009 study found that 14 participants with social anxiety disorder who participated in two months of meditation training reported decreased anxiety and improve self-esteem after completing the program. So again, these holistic practices help the mind to focus on the present, making individuals less likely to ruminate about the past or be anxious about the future, which can fuel anxiety and depression. Next slide. Mindfulness meditation can help fight addiction. These holistic practices can alter the brain receptors associated with drug and alcohol addiction, which may in turn reduce cravings for these substances. That is huge. By having a daily meditation or mindfulness practice, one may be able to experience less cravings. Additionally, mindfulness and meditation can increase awareness of cravings, which make us better to manage them. So many individuals having relapse will say, you know, they'll do a chain analysis and they'll say, I wasn't even aware that I was being triggered. I wasn't even aware of what was going on inside of me. So the more that we can help individuals to be attuned to feelings, to be in the present moment, the better they will be able to identify and then utilize coping skills that can help them to fight and ride out the wave of the triggers or the cravings. This one I love. Um, meditation and mindfulness can help um, foster compassion, loving and kindness towards self and others. There are actual specific loving kindness meditations that people can practice on a daily basis, which will help um, promote a really loving and compassionate relationship with oneself, which will then in turn help people learn and trust themselves in being loving and compassionate towards others. These types of meditations can strengthen circuits in the brain that can help us to pick up on other people's emotions, promote altruistic behaviors, and decrease implicit or unconscious bias that is responsible for perpetuating harmful stereotypes. So basically, if we can help everybody, whether they're in treatment or not, to participate in mindfulness and meditation practices, the world will probably be a more loving, happier place. Next slide. So, you know, integrating holistic practices into programming, I, I know that, um, and, and I think really, even now more than ever, um, it's really, really, really important to be mindful of integrating these practices into programming. CBT, DBT, EMDR, um, cognitive remediation, these are all important. And 
so are the holistic practices. It cannot be one or the other. It has to be both. As Dr. Katwiki talked about, um, one of your slides talked about the top 10 inflammatory triggers. And if you look at those triggers, coronavirus and the lockdowns are like a breeding ground, like the sedentary lifestyle, the staying behind computer screens and not getting enough sleep. So now more than ever, it is so important to integrate these practices into day-to-day -day life to protect against these inflammatory triggers, which negatively impact our mental wellness. So what, what we are suggesting is that in conjunction with conventional therapy and coaching, that treatment programs uh, integrate as many holistic groups as possible into day-to-day -day treatment programming. So on a day-to-day -day basis, there should be at least one to two opportunities for clients to participate in yoga, fitness, moving, walking groups, nutrition education, mindfulness, meditation, because these are just as important to their overall healing as the other programmatic um, practices that we put into place. In addition, you know, for many clients, I think doing some of these practices in a group setting can be difficult, especially at first as they're learning the skills, it can be pretty overwhelming in the case of um, exercise or yoga, some client or some shame attached to it and embarrassment. So opportunities to, to do work one-on-one -on -one with a provider until they ease their way into a group setting can be, uh, can be really helpful as well. Next slide, please. Because we, uh, we all know about the importance of mindfulness, meditation, yoga, exercise, these holistic practices for the effective treatment of mental illness, uh, we thought it was really important to put together a, a study to, that specifically looks at how these holistic interventions impact outcomes and in what way they prevent outcomes. As I said to the, at the beginning of the presentation, um, you know, insurance companies are, are tricky. Managed care, the managed care system is, is, is tricky to navigate. And the more research that we have that can back, um, that there is concrete evidence supporting these practices, the more that we can appeal to those companies, um, and really advocate that our clients get, um, get reimbursed for these things that are just as integral to their mental wellness and to their recovery as practices like DBT, CBT, et cetera. So we, we started a study and it's, it's really in its beginning stages, but what we're looking at is um, how this holistic model is impacting anxiety and depression, but then also factors like friendship, rejection, ability to participate in life and self-efficacy. And next slide, please. The, the preliminary results are, you know, kind of amazing. It's, it's, it's amazing to see it on paper. We've all known it in our heads, but what we're seeing is that generalized anxiety has gone down from a level that is scaled at a more moderate level to mild after nine months. Depression has gone down from severe moderate to mild. There's an inverse correlation between friendship and rejection levels. Uh, clinically significant increase in the ability to, to participate. So by doing these practices on a day-to-day -day basis, our clients are able to participate in life, in the outside world, in a way that feels meaningful to them, which is huge because that makes them feel good about themselves. Uh, and then also self-efficacy scores approaching neurotypical levels at the nine month mark when they were pretty severely compromised to start treatment. So, you know, these findings are, are super promising. And again, I think just 
should be challenging, we should be challenging ourselves as, as mental health providers in this field to get creative and come up with more and more ways to integrate these practices into day-to-day -day programming because these are the things also that clients can take with them when they leave treatment and utilize on a day-to-day -day basis in their outside lives. So again, you know, more research is needed. There's, there's no doubt about that. Um, I would certainly be curious to um, see research on this in different levels of care, whether that's residential, whether that's wilderness programming, whether that's outpatient programming, see how results vary um, based on level of care. And then coming together as treatment providers and um, really working with one another to advocate on behalf of our clients so that the powers that be um, begin to reimburse for these practices at higher rates. And with that, um, I am going to end and leave time. I saw a lot of stuff coming through through the chat box. So I wanna make sure that we have time for discussion and questions and John will be facilitating that aspect of the presentation. Fantastic. Ray, Amanda, thank you both. That was, uh, that was absolutely wonderful. And the enthusiasm is reflected in the chat box. So I'm excited to, uh, to, to get to that. And, um, you know, personally, thank you for getting me out of my head and into my body um, and giving me, uh, giving me that important perspective today. Um, Jennifer made a couple of, of, of great comments. I, I just wanted to mention one of them. She, she used the term right on, which I, I don't think we hear all that often anymore. So thank you for that, Jennifer. Decreasing inflammation and toxicity, 90% of our neurotransmitters start in our gut and are communicated to our brain. It's a gut feeling. So thank you for that, Jennifer. Uh, we also got a recommendation from Charles, uh, recommended reading by the name of Spark. And we'll go ahead. I think there was a couple of comments that came in about uh, sending a follow-up PowerPoint presentation and certainly we'll suggest some of these recommended readings as well. Um, Tom Mizell had a question, since there is an increase in the implement, in implementation process secondary to depression, theoretically, can an anti-inflammatory like Celebrex help to reduce depression? And Ray, I, I know you were talking about a study uh, that you were referencing sort of preliminary results. Do you want to jump on that? Yeah, it's a, a great question, Tom. Um, and it, it's interesting. I uh, have um, talked with several people about um, their sort of over-the-counter use of things like Celebrex and ibuprofen. Um, and it seems that there's a real relationship in just, you know, these cases that sometimes people um, know that they feel better when they take an anti-inflammatory medication and so continue to take it is sort of a, a sub, you know, op optimal way to treat um, their depression or their anxiety. So the preliminary data actually do suggest that that is um, somewhat helpful. Um, I have uh, prescribed Celebrex, which is the one that has been studied, um, to several patients who did have treatment-resistant depression with CRP levels in the 20s, which is astronomically high. And um, the outcomes were sort of half and half. Half of the people said, yeah, I thought it made a little bit of a difference. And half of the people said, it's just like a placebo. So um, I'm not sure that the outcome data really support that clinical use at this point, um, but the theory is right on. Um, the problem, of course, is you can't take a non anti-inflammatory medication forever because it causes stomach ulcers and kidney failure and other very um, undesirable uh, effects. So that's why they're looking at the class of medicines that are currently being used to treat rheumatoid arthritis because they're given um, through IVs and it bypasses um, some of those other side effect problems. But um, it's exactly the way to think about this. And I wouldn't be surprised um, if in another two years, hopefully you'll ask me to come back and I'll be able to share with you that the new treatment recommendations for major depressive disorder include CBT, an antidepressant medication and a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Right, thank you for that. Um, and a trip to the gym. Go ahead, Charles. I think I missed that. I said, and among those recommendations would be also a trip to the gymnasium. 
Absolutely. And I, I can speak, Charles, from personal experience because I can't go to the gym anymore um, <laughs> because of COVID. Um, I really feel worse. Yes. And, you know, it's not just because I've gained, you know, the 19 pounds associated with COVID-19. It's because I really do miss that. And right. you know, sweating and um, having your heart rate uh, go up and down trains your sympathetic and your parasympathetic systems in your body to be much more reactive for other things, like when you're anxious or when you're angry or when right. you're sad. And I think I missed that. I feel like my body isn't doing a good job um, as it was when I went to the gym four times a week before this. A couple of points on that. I made a recommendation in the, in the uh, chat room for reading. Uh, there's a book called Spark by Dr. John Rady, Rady who's uh, out of the Harvard Medical School, which is specifically about physical exercise and its impact on the brain, neuroplasticity, its impact on depression, anxiety, addiction, all the neurotransmitters, et cetera. It's a great little read. It's not a scientific read. It's more of a self-help kind of style book, but it's a, really a great read. And the other good thing, I was talking to him on the phone and I said, that I, I have adopted in my life and lectured my kids innumerably, for which I'm sure they're eternally grateful, that one of the best rules in life is the gym cures everything. Go to the gym. I feel bad. I have the flu. Go to the gym. Feel bad. I'm depressed. Go to the gym. Just go to the gym. So it's great. And it turns and out plus that when you go to the gym, when you go to the gym, you have a group experience, whether you're with a group or not, because there are other people right. there working out and everybody's at least there's some sense of sharing, even if you just got the big weightlifters in the grunt room, you're in there with them. And, and it turns yeah. out that physical exercise is the only evidence-based intervention to uh, slow or prevent the development of neurocognitive disorders like Alzheimer's dementia. Mm -hmm. um, so all of the, you know, um, the amantadines and the uh, nemenda and all these other things, they really don't do very much. Um, but getting uh, cardiovascular physical exercise is the best solution for that. Right. Right. Which is one of the reasons I've forgotten everything else, except I do go to the gym. There was um, a question in the chat box about, you know, if, if we have recommendations for individuals that have injuries and can't utilize uh, high intensity interval exercise, HIIT training. Um, and, you know, clearly you don't want somebody to get more injured going to the gym. That's, that's not going to make them feel better physically or emotionally. Um, but that said, even with injuries, there's always, you know, I would always suggest working with a professional, um, but there's always ways to modify or scale movements so that you're protected and that you're not gonna make your injury worse yet still be able to get um, your heart rate up and some of the benefits of, of HIIT training. Yeah, it's a great point. Charles. Um, you know, physical therapists are exceptionally good at figuring those kind of workarounds out. Um, we're trying to get an arm bike for people who are, you know, not able to run or to, to do things with their lower bodies. Um, you can find a way to, you know, do repetitive kinds of uh, muscle movements with especially uh, fast twitch muscles that can um, get your heart rate going, um, you know, through things like that. You just have to be innovative and creative. Swimming. Can yeah. I ask a quick question? Hi, um, I'm just wondering, um, a lot of people that have depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, um, are being highly medicated. And so if they're not putting on an enormous amount of weight, or they're not exhibiting signs of maybe akathisia from, you know, some of the psychotropics, or, um, you know, uh, so many, or just somnolence, they're extremely tired. And, um, with all these medications, it makes it so much more difficult um, to have them become encouraged or inspired to even get up to do body movement, uh, something small uh, such as that, because the, medica the medication, the drugs, I should call them, I'd prefer to call them drugs because that's what they are. And, uh, and then, you know, so many of these people wind up... <clears throat> They wind up uh, getting drug withdrawals if they're on a benzo, and that's a fast-acting, uh, you know, uh, drug. And they, you know, they wind up getting brain withdrawal and cognition impairment. And then 
in this industry, everybody is blaming it on the actual mental illness of the drugs as being very uh, active participants in these people's inability to actually have mindfulness, to actually go and exercise and to make you know healthier decisions to repair their own brains and bodies. So, I mean, what I, I would ask, I think like what, what, what's a suggestion in trying to figure out how to get a person because it's almost like velocity, right? Like you have to, you have to get past that point in order to, to start to feel this relief and go in that direction. And, but when you're in that position, it's so difficult just to get up mm -hmm. and do anything, even take your trash out. And so it's like, there has to be some sort of a beginner's plan, mm -hmm. right? Like a beginner's plan. And then mm, the last thing I wanted to say is just your, your guys uh, insight or take on that we talk about depression and um, here in, I'm in Colorado, but this is an, a nationwide uh, epidemic amongst our teens and uh, that they're ending their lives. Mm. And uh, the problem that I have more than anything is that there's not transparency. It's very ironic that the age range on the black box warning, most parents, most doctors, and certainly the people aff afflicted by depression are not aware that each antidepressant has a black box warning, which is a bold, black, a bold warning from the FDA that one of the side effects is suicidal ideation and suicide. Um, and that is between the exact age range of the epidemic that is going on nationwide, but in greater numbers for some reason here in Colorado. So when the child takes their life, uh, nobody blames it on the drug because they're not even aware that there is a black box warning for this exact age range. And, but what can we do to help to protect our children you know, uh, they're, they're not being, uh, people are not informed and there needs to be more transparency. So I'm gonna stop there, stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. So I, I, I really heard guys, you know, obviously recognizing the role of medication, both, both its benefits and, and also potential drawbacks, setbacks, risk factors associated. Amanda, you want to start? As the prescriber here, I feel the need to jump in because I, I agree with your um, your take homes a little bit, Jennifer, but I have to disagree with you in a couple of areas. And I just feel the need to be able to um, provide the alternative point of view. Um, so first of all, when people are over medicated, they act very much the way that you describe with you know lack of initiative, lack of... Um, sort of energy and things like that. But remember that schizophrenia is a good example. Untreated psychosis actually is neurotoxic. And so in order that we help somebody retain their ability to think and to put you know, plans together and do all the mindfulness meditation that um, goes along with their treatment, they have to reserve brain cells. And the way that we know how to do that is through the judicious use of pharmacologic interventions. Um, and so um, psychiatric medicines are also anti-inflammatory. It's one of the reasons why cardiologists put people who've had a heart attack on antidepressant medications when they're not depressed um, because they decrease the inflammatory uh, systems response that predisposes people for additional heart attacks. Um, and then secondly, the black box warning um, I think the data really speak for themselves, and I'm, I'm going to do something that I shouldn't do in a, a setting like this, but I'm going to contradict you. Um, when the black box warnings were put on the labels, people stopped prescribing antidepressants because they didn't want to get into trouble um, for 15 to 24-year-olds, and the suicide rates went up almost um, by double um, because the number of antidepressants that were being prescribed went down. And so the question that I would encourage everyone to ask is what would the suicide completion rates be in that population if they were not on an, any antidepressant medications? And it's a study that I don't wanna do. I don't think anybody wants to do that, but that's what you would have to show in order to say that the use, again, judicious use of antidepressant medications is actually very, very helpful in preventing suicides in people with depression. 
No, I thank you. Um, I do appreciate your your feedback, and um, you know, I think that um, the 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 fact right now is that it's an epidemic proportions like never before, and sitting in a, a legislative meeting um, for suicide prevention at the Capitol Hill with legislators and families that lost their loved ones. Um, they didn't know what a black box warning was, and I'm not looking to uh, go against pharma, uh, you know, ph ph uh, pharmacology here. Uh, I'm merely looking for transparency so that doctors could have a, a very good plan, um, and a, a, a care plan with the family so that they know what to look for in case it is the medication in the teen's mind that is actually causing this uh, the suicidal ideation. So that's what I think is important is the transparency so that care plans could be developed and adhered to uh, more efficiently than not having that knowledge at all. And one thing amongst these families is that none of them knew uh, that this was a black box warning, what it was, and they had no idea that this could be a potential side effect. So I think that that open dialogue uh, amongst caregivers, doctors, and their patients and the families as an integrative team would be able to look for those signs better and then, you know, potentially not lose somebody because of the medication. So, um, you know, is it the depression or the medication? It could be either, really. You know, yeah. as, go, as, go ahead, Amanda. I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, just quickly, just anecdotally, as a non prescriber, what I will say is that, you know, do we see clients who are over medicated? Absolutely. You know, 100%. They end up in ERs and, you know, things happen. That said, um, you know, the proper and titrated sort of prescribing of medications enables clients to get to a baseline where they can do the mindfulness, they can do the meditation, um, and can participate in these activities that ultimately make them, you know, feel better. And I think that's where, you know, collaboration between prescribers, non-prescribers, um, who are all seeing the client, you know, together through different lenses, communicating and working together is, you know, how to get the, the best results and how to, how to reach that sweet spot where they're on the right exactly. amount. Um, not too much, not too little, but there is a right amount that is, that is life-changing. And then also with the antidepressants, and again, as a non-prescriber, where I have seen issues is not that they're being prescribed to uh, an antidepressant for depression and something goes wrong. It's when they're being prescribed an antidepressant, but they're really bipolar or they're really something else. That's when something goes wrong. As long as they're prescribed it for the right reasons and it's being followed closely, the results are usually quite good. Thank you for that, Amanda. And Ray, we're gonna, we're gonna take an opportunity to wrap here so we can all do a little mindfulness before our four o'clock appointment. Um, thank you all for, for joining us today, uh, Dr. Kotwicki and Amanda Falk. Thank you both for this, uh, this wonderful, wonderful discussion. Um, as I mentioned, we'll be following up with a copy of the PowerPoint presentation. So you'll have that by the end of the day today, as well as all of our in individual contact information and hopes to, uh, to keep this conversation going. We will be back uh, on March 25th um, with a conversation about a new affiliate uh, program of the dorm that we just opened up that is gender affirming recovery housing. Um, that's a, a, a new model that we just opened up in New York City that we're excited to tell you a little bit more about. So join us on, uh, on March 25th. We will see you then. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>